Hello, hello. 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 Hey. It's All right, everybody. You. Check this out. This is the awesome Melanie Grant. She is a journalist, the luxury editor of The Economist, sister publication, Economist 1843. She has written the most gorgeous and informative, most importantly, book called Coveted which I hope you have all have already. But if you don't, we're going to give you more information about how to get it. We have so much to do today. But most importantly, this is a fun, casual chat. This is not formal, good kid. We want everybody jumping in. Please throw your comments in the comments. Please throw your questions in the question box. Melanie's awesome. And we're just going to you know, kick it off with kind of an overview of a little bit of her background, we're going to talk about how she started the book and got it, you know, all, all set up. It's been a massive undertaking. Then we're going to talk about jewelry as art or not art, female power, and the way that materials and symbolism affect how we actually view pieces and development and their, you know, their place in time as well as in collections. So um, we just got a shout out for our headpieces. Melanie and I are <laughs> expressing ourselves and as we get into female power you're going to find out a lot more about why but welcome welcome melanie thank you um, thank you sharon so our viewers may not know a lot about how a journalist and a luxury editor works so do you mind just talking about your path to being at the economist and as you and i have chatted like that's not the first place i think of for someone with such a passion for jewelry so how did you come to the economist and how did you come to your love of jewelry well, my love of jewellery was the first thing really that happened to me. I think um, my grandma, who had a lovely co sort of collection of vintage jewellery um, and a lot of costume jewellery, would let me wear it. And she, she had a fantastic rose garden in West London. And, you know, when your, your parents always sort of tell you not to do things, but she'd like give me things to wear. We'd be gardening together and I was like helping her. Uh, and it was just, it reminded me of this time when I was a kid where you just felt this love all around you, you know, and this beauty in this garden. And often when I wear pieces, I really think of that time where we had together, such a special time. Um, and so I started collecting when I was like a teenager and I got to flea markets in London and sort of buy sort of, um, I collected silver at that point, sort of antique silver. Um, and then I ended up sort of doing media studies at university, which at that time was a very new subject. And I really wanted to be a journalist. I knew it from, from when I was very young. Um, and from there, I sort of ended up working in newspapers and magazines. And I, I started working at The Economist about 14 years ago. I can't believe it's been that long. Wow. Um, and I kind of started on the visual side, styling and doing photography. And then about seven years ago, it's a very long answer to this question, Cartier asked me to go and write about an exhibition in Paris at the Grand Palais. It was a big historical exhibition of their, of their work. And um, I just said to them, I'm not really a writer. You know, I can come and sort of, you know, look at it, but I'm not. And they said, well, just come. They knew, of course. So I went and it just yeah. changed everything. In that auditorium, in the dark, looking at this fantastic jewellery, I kind of left different. Something happened to me. I don't really know what it was. It was like a spiritual experience. And I just, when I came out, I just thought I need to do that. I need to be closer to it, to understand it, to write about it, to figure out like why it's so special. And that was the first thing I ever really wrote for The Economist. And then I just, oh. after that was down a rabbit hole. I was just trying to write everything I could. And since we're gonna be talking about female power, how many women yes. were on staff when you were at, uh, when you started and now at The Economist? Well, actually we have, we have quite a lot of women, but the difference is maybe in the last, eight or nine years, like all my bosses are women. And that's changed. Oh, that's cool. So that's really good. We, we, yeah. we have some very strong women at The Economist. And it's one of the reasons I like being there because this book really happened because very strong women kind of helped me write in the beginning. You know, I, ha I didn't know what I was doing at all. It's a, it's a terrifying place to start writing because everyone's so good. And there was about three or four women who were just really fantastic at what they do. And they took me under their wing and they looked at my pieces and, you know, it, 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 without them, I don't think I'd be here because I wouldn't have learned to write with, with such, um, I suppose, elegance. 
they're very elegant writers. They get a lot of information in, but it, it you know, they have a real way. There's a, there's a real economist style, which um, I have, you know, learned being there. So it's been a pleasure to learn somewhere as good as that. I love that. So here's the book. And how do we end up with this is a massive tome, you've covered a, a real comprehensive assessment of high jewelry throughout the world. You're at 75 artists that are included. Would you mind talking a little bit about how you went along building the 75? Did you build up? Did you whittle down? And what elements did you consider as you were building it up? Yeah, I mean, I had about 300. I made a list wow. when I realized it was, this was going to be a serious thing. When Fiden said, to, you know, like, okay, let's do it. I had a list of about 300. And I remember being in New York on, for work, you know, kind of sitting there in a hotel room thinking, how am I going to get this list down to like 80 or 75 uh, designers? And it was an agonizing experience because, you know, I, I know a lot of the contemporary designers, um, and everyone has something that I like. You know, I, I, there's not many designers in the world that I can't look at everything they do and think that's brilliant. But like, I suppose in a way, I went for people who I felt without them, this book wouldn't make any sense. Mm. Um, people who had shifted design by just being in the world mm -hmm. and people who had a totally unique take on the highest level of creativity. So that, you know, my heart, if my heart hurt to take them out, I left them in. And obviously there were a couple of people which didn't fit into the flow of what we were saying, but it was a, it was a really tough, tough thing to do to whittle it down to 75. Um, you are getting much love from people who've either bought the book or Kathleen Caru just said that it's on her Christmas list, which I think considering this came from the archivist of Van Clef and Arpels, that's Ooh. a great endorsement. Um, and it is worth it. I will say, you know, for, for all of us who love jewelry, I've bought a ton of different books on jewelry and a lot of them sometimes are just really pretty pictures. I learned a lot in this book. It is so well researched. It's a lot of fun to read as well. And I wanna jump into something that some of you may not know. Um, ooh, somebody's name is Khan Shahrukh. I love that. If you, <laughs> don't, if you know me, you know that I'm obsessed with SRK. So I'm just gonna give a little shout out to that one. Um, so, you know, you make the observation in the book that art and jewelry once were one. So Leonardo trained in metallurgy, Picasso, Dali, Man Ray all made jewels. Today we see sculptor Jasmine Thomas Gerdvin creating cufflinks. Nick Cave uses jewels in his contemporary art. Simone Brewster creates furniture as well as jewelry. Not to mention, obviously, we have Frank Geary for Tiffany and Company and um, Hadid for Jensen. So with all of this crossover, why do you think only a few like JAR are in the 70s in particular are really described first as artists? And I'm going to go to your first image. Yeah, I think, you know, stones and intrinsic value really complicate the idea of what art can be. Mm -hmm. um, even fine jewelers, uh, fine artists who make jewelry tend to avoid big stones, they tend to avoid stones completely sometimes. And in my very rigorous research for, for many years, I talked to a lot of people. And the thing I realized was that stones, especially diamonds, tended to take away from the art in people's perceptions of what art is. Mm -hmm. So these are a good example. These are Hemelay, they're iron spike earrings with massive white diamonds. And so what you have to do is you have to overwhelm the stone with design for it to have a chance to be art. Hemelay do it very well, very famously. Um, some people create jewelry just to be sold as a, as a product. And obviously that is an art, but the, at the highest level, high jewelry, which has a recognizable style, um, you know, can get there, but definitely the stones have to be in service to the design. It can't be just, here's a massive stone. It's really expensive. I'm going to wear it as a show of wealth. That is an art. I love this example from Van Cleef and Arpels. Will you talk about yeah. why you selected it? These are one of my favorite of all time pieces, the pylon. I mean, for me, it's got everything. It's futuristic, um, it's modernist, it's simple, architectural. I mean, it's stone heavy. Another good example, it's stone heavy, but the stones just are a part of the design. 
you know, mm -hmm. the stones are everywhere, but it's not about the stones. It's about the art of the piece. Mm -hmm. So for me, this does everything that I'm trying to explain in the book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these are rare pieces. Um, as far as I know, I think there's just a handful of them in the world. These are, I think, brooches. You know, there's a, there's a ring. There aren't many of them. Um, and I think occasionally they have been made in rubies, but I've never seen a picture and I've never seen a ruby version. Uh, Katrin, could you answer for us? Is there a yeah. ruby version? I think part of it, I, I know I've seen the ring in the Musée des Arts Décoratifs. Mm -hmm. um, but what's cool about this too is this is from the 30s. Right, so we're yeah. talking about mind-blowing modernism, right? This I looks mean, to be from right now. This is the beautiful thing about modernism. I mean, it's absolutely timeless. You know, if yeah. you'd said to me this was made yesterday, I would say yes. You know, so I, if I was going to buy something, you know, these would be on my list. Yeah, and you and I overlap on this one. So we're going to get into this later about, you know, what does it mean when we think about jewelry to be pretty, about jewelry to be strong, you know, what's driving our decision making. So just to foreshadow, that's where we're heading. But, you know, another big area for art, and we have uh, Vishal from Vak with us, who brings me to this nice example, which is, you know, there is this comment you make in the book and a very important one I think that sales and auctions can really mm. reflect not just desirability yeah. I would add collectability as art but also they can signal the emergence of an artist so Vak, for example sells you know positions himself through the highest level of auctions to establish that art collector track record mm. and here we're looking at um, Cindy Chow who has done extraordinarily well. Would you mind talking about why you picked this piece? I picked this piece because Cindy um, makes one butterfly a year. Um, and I think this is the 2012 butterfly. Yes. Yeah. Um, and again, sort of gem encrusted, quite large, um, very much for me a symbolism of, of the new kind of power coming out of, of mm -hmm. parts of Asia. Um, really more is more which is my kind of thing um, and i think the auction houses are very important because when you're trying to buy a piece of high jewelry you know it's price and application it's privately sold often nobody knows the price apart from the person who actually bought it right the auction room is the only place where you can see the market in full flow which mm -hmm. is the open market and it's about market credibility so some designers sell really well at auction Mm -hmm. and don't sell that well in, in real life and vice versa. But for the Absolutely. most part, it's quite an accurate idea of how desirable in the market a designer is. And obviously at The Economist, we, we are quite interested in the economic sort of ramifications of, of sort of things like rare, beautiful things. So Cindy for me, you know, Cindy is fairly new in a sense yeah. um, uh, to be at this level, but she has stormed up the charts yeah. Um, and every piece I see of hers it, it is mind blowing. I mean, it's so complex and the craftsmanship is wonderful and the stones and the design are completely her. You see a piece, you know it's her. Now these are still big stones. So when we're going through our art discussion, these are the results from um, mm. two days ago for Feng Jie. Yeah. And again, we have, you know, 2.2, I think it finished at $2.6 million for this necklace. And then we also have another example of a huge stone piece with Anna Hu with the Piper yeah. necklace. Yeah. I'll just put another image of it. Do you think that in order to perform at auction, we're still stuck in that big stone space? And what do you think that says about enabling the artist to work? Yeah, I mean, I think it's still overwhelmingly about big diamonds or mm -hmm. certain rubies or certain cashmere sapphires. Um, it's still that vehicle of intrinsic wealth that people mm -hmm. are bidding over at auction. Obviously, there are examples, you know, there are kind of people like Jar who, who sell 10 times the amount, you know, the original sum. And there are a, a handful of people who can sell very well at auction, who are living designers, but there aren't many who don't incorporate very, very large stones. Mm -hmm. And I think the auction room also is an investment, you know, kind of place where people go to invest in art mm -hmm. in terms of fine art but also stones and furniture and everything so it is a marketplace in that in that respect 
Um, it's even more important for female designers to get that auction track record going yes. to establish themselves because we're looking at, you know, Anna Hu and Feng Jie and Cindy Chow now have a pretty astonishing multi-million dollar record. So, you know, when they go, I would imagine to manage their investors or to try to expand or to try to have those conversations, they can point to results. And that may be yeah. a big part of how to advance, particularly as a woman. What do you think? I think it's an important indicator of the empowerment and the, the evolution of, of female design. Mm -hmm. um, it's important that women do smash some of these records mm -hmm. to show that, you know, women can design at the top level commercially as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to see the value transferred to more design led pieces rather than just massive stones eventually at some point, which is the whole idea behind the book that we want to see the value passed to the art rather than the intrinsic value of the actual materials. But I think it's a good start because 30 years ago, you know, we wouldn't have seen this at auction. It would have been um, a very different estate type of jewelry. Um, yep. So the fact that modern contemporary women are selling at this level is, is important, I think. Uh, Rachel Goyal Sikri just asked a really good question. Do you think sometimes auctions can be harmful when you don't sell for as much as the public may have expected? Because, of course, yes. there is that element of randomness that can really yeah. hurt. Auctions are a gamble. Yeah. You know, for that reason, some designers, some designers put their pieces into auctions to see where they are. Um, some designers, obviously, you have no control. As a designer, you sell your piece to a collector. The collect it pops up. You have no, you get nothing from that. And I remember seeing um, something um, with a, oh, who was it? I think Damien Hurst or somebody commenting on a piece that came up from, from their, mm -hmm. um, one of their old pieces that said, you know, this went for 300 million euros, but I don't see a penny of this actually. It's quite difficult sometimes to watch a piece which I made 30 years ago sell for a huge sum and I get no actual benefit from that. Oh, absolutely. It was all my work. So I think that is the flip side. Even if it does very well, it can be quite a wrench to watch that when you don't get any benefit from it. Such but on the other side, if it doesn't sell. Right, think about sell, all the people sell. where Basquiat scribbled something to them and the yeah. estate is now watching where the numbers go through the roof, but it yeah. goes to the collector or the lucky yeah. recipient, not the yeah. artist. Not Excellent the artist. point. Now, you and I are going to transition. Uh, by the way, uh, Catherine did clarify she's seen sketches but does not believe there is a Ruby Pilon that was made. So, and I mean, Catherine, you broke imagine, my heart. <laughs> uh, yeah, bench jewelers who are watching, we've got a couple. Can you imagine the nightmare of calibrating rubies and the loss if you mess up? I'm not, I'm not totally shocked. But now let's get into... Um, the the sculptural and the art that you care deeply about. Mm -hmm. And I want to highlight Vernier because in the book you highlight Vernier as not using stones in many of their pieces. And you make the statement as women buy for themselves in greater mm -hmm. numbers, the jewels they want often dispense with the romantic depiction of subjects in so-called figurative jewelry. So why do you think women wouldn't want big old stones when they're buying for themselves? And, you know, can you talk about what abstract pieces reflect in the wearer? And this is, of course, a lovely piece from Vernier. Yeah, I, I think that powerful women, because you have to be fairly powerful to spend a certain amount of money, um, especially if you're, you're, you're buying your own piece. Um, they, they do like stones, but I don't think they're wearing them as a show of wealth. Because when you have real power, you don't have to. You have the power. So I think Vernier is interesting because for me, they're a really great example of very sculptural, sometimes quite stone heavy pieces, which again, the design is first and the stones are there, but it's not about the stones. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, and it depends where we're talking about. In the West, the more money you have, often the more sort of, ironic you become in your jewelry um, and in the east it's a lot still a lot more about showing how well you've done so depending on where you are the show of spectacular jewelry does slightly change mm -hmm. um, and some places just it's just safer to wear massive diamonds in some places than it is in others you know 
So, I mean, a Vernier piece for me, there's a kind of, there's a slight irony in terms of the design because it's, I mean, like, this is great. This is jet mm -hmm. and white diamonds. I love this. This is so me. Um, and for me, you know, some people might think this is costume jewellery, which again is a plus. Mm -hmm. I want personally something where you have to kind of look again and think, mm -hmm. what is that? Mm -hmm. And that for me is great design. And it's and just when we're, when we're specifically talking about women buying for themselves, yes. Yes. I think it also gets into what's, what are you flexing with your jewelry? Are you making yourself feel a certain way, more powerful, prettier, like you've made it, faking it until you make it? Like what's motivating the decision, right? So, you know, yeah. to me, when I look at this piece, I already have a mental model of this person is so sleek and in control and powerful. Yeah. And then, you know, maybe you embody it or you already are that person when you reach for that ring. Yeah. But then what happens if it's, Richard just said all of the above. If it's all of the above, you know, how do we think that a female gaze on the design changes it? And that brings us to my next point, which is you highlight um, James de Givenchy with Tefan as using minimalism mm -hmm. to take his jewelry beyond intrinsic value. Mm -hmm. But you point out that that really starts with Suzanne Belperon as one of the few female masters to focus yeah. on minimal work. So can we talk a little bit about how she figures into female power and how her jewelry reflects it? I mean, for me, she was a master. She's one of the, the most important female jewelers of all time for me, because these earrings, they, they are so simple. It takes so much to, to be this confident, this simple, this stripped back in a place, in a, in a place like the jewelry industry, which prizes intricacy and more as value. So, you know, she was an exceptional woman I think she won a competition when she was 18, a jewelry competition. She never looked back. She didn't come from money. She came from a humble background. You know, she went to Paris and she, she trained and she concentrated and she just became this phenomenal designer at a time when women weren't supposed to work, um, let alone, you know, be in business and really challenging most of the men at the top level. You know, she was in the resistance in Paris. I mean, she just, she just kicked ass, basically. I love her. I wish I could have known her. And, and I love her design. It's I so want, timeless. I want to push on this one, though, because yeah. at the time in particular, we're looking at just coming out of World War II. It's still yeah. primarily men buying jewelry yeah. for women. So when you're putting out this bold, I'm not showing mm -hmm. off, I'm not going to tell you how wealthy I am, is it a surprise to you that she was not as recognized in her lifetime with financial success? I mean, this, you know, if no. you're, if you're yeah, looking she... at this Chalcedony earrings, I mean, are you, are you flexing with these if you're buying them as a gift for someone? I think great design is rarely recognized in its true greatness at the time. Like anything, it's, a, it's before it's time. It's too early. People don't under, really understand it. You know, you're doing it at a time where everything is, is the opposite of what you're doing. And mm -hmm. so in a way, you never truly get to enjoy the success of your actual work. Mm -hmm. Because by the time people realize how great it is, you know, you've popped off. So I'm not surprised. And this was at a time as well where jewelry high jewellery was traditionally given um, as a pass of wealth. You know, men sometimes would gift a nice piece of jewellery to show their affection. But, you know, there, aren't, there weren't that many women who were not royalty or inherited wealth who could buy at a very high level in terms of disposable income. The average person, you know, couldn't afford this kind of thing. And so what I love now is that women after World War II, after they got more disposable income uh, and got a high level of education around the world, have now, are now in a position to buy whatever they like mm. a lot of the time, not all the time. Um, and that has changed design because they're asking for different things because they're actually wearing the jewellery. If a man buys the jewellery, he's not wearing it. He sees it slightly differently most of the time. 
if a, if a powerful woman's buying jewellery, she often wants something bigger, bolder, more sculptural, and a little bit dangerous. Yeah. To me, the balance with this Tefan piece is achieved because yeah. it still gives you the flex that you're successful and you've made it. So it's sleek. It's fabulous, but you're not confused. This is a piece that I just think you look at it and you know what it is, right? He's hit a balance in his lifetime. Mm. And so uh, Catherine just said, I think only yeah. posterity recognizes jewelry work. And, you know, I'm really interested in the exceptions to that. So, you know, Tafan is hitting it right now. Um, mm -hmm. Emmanuel Tafan, who is on our call, is my call for hitting it. And yes. hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, what does it take to be commercial while still achieving that first big A artist before we say jewelry? I mean, I think it takes wildness. You know, the people I talk to who I believe are, have greatness, they just do whatever they want. They don't listen to anyone. They don't listen to the market. They don't try and sell anything. Um, they don't try and make anything that's trendy. They just do what's in them and they let it come out and they don't try and second guess it. They don't even try and sell the piece themselves. They just make whatever they like. That wildness is the beginning of genius for me. Sometimes you don't like it at all, but the fact is it's completely different because they're not listening to anything else. Um, that takes courage on a level that most people just don't have which is why I they completely are agree. But then doesn't it restrict us to the realm of the people who have been born fortunate, right? Because it's a much bigger yeah. risk if you're not coming from a family that can back you while you're marching well, to your own, you know, drummer. I would say that some of the best jewelers of all time can come from money. They're just wild people. It's just, you know, you have to struggle and you have to experience the pain to get it. You know, you can't, you know, this is agonizing to make. Mm -hmm. It's hard to buy. It mm -hmm. should be, you know, it's agony and ecstasy. You can't, I'm a, a huge believer. You shouldn't buy high jewelry to put it in the safe as an investment. Buy it. Please wear don't. It. don't do it. <laughs> Please wear your jewelry. Wear it's it. It's supposed and to I be want you fun. To, to understand how, what it took to make that. It has, you have to, you have to struggle to buy it in order to get the agony of creation. Otherwise, don't bother. And then how do you feel if it's gifted to you? So if we fall back, and that actually brings us to another cool point that you make mm -hmm. in the book. And again, for those of you who's, who've joined us recently, the book is called Coveted. It is uh, amazing. And there's a lot of deep content about power and art that we're mm -hmm. focusing on today. So you make the point, this is David Webb, that Webb mm -hmm. in the 70s reflects women's liberation. Can we talk mm -hmm. about you know, what you see in his work from the time period and why you think this man was particularly attuned to the social changes? Yeah, I mean, I think we were just saying about people coming from money. He was an outsider. You know, he was yeah. a North Carolina country boy. He, you know, he was very young. He went to New York. I mean, being an outsider has real value because you look at, you look at everything so differently with such new eyes. If you're given everything, sometimes it kind of ruins you, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of how you see the world because it's just, you don't have to discover anything. It's just there. You can just pick it up, you know. And I think where, because of who he was, you know, approached it so differently. I mean, I love the web pieces. They're so over the top and, and big hammered metal, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a very sort of 70s piece. I love um, it. You know, I just, for me, this is the start of really powerful sort of female body armor, really, mm. in the 70s. And, and yet from the 70s to the 80s and 90s, we go back to this image of the trophy wife, right? So this is from yeah. Casino. We have the man providing the woman. And I mean, to be perfectly honest, I think that does play into, as you and I have talked about, this mm -hmm. idea of, you know, somebody is coming to rescue me. There yeah. is a man who will take care of things and he will yeah. deign to give me beautiful things because I am a beautiful thing to be possessed as well. And like, what a yuck message. Right? <laughs> so we go from you know, Gloria Steinem here, 
And yeah. then suddenly we're all the way back. So why do you think the pendulum swung so hard? And this is still, I think, very much tied up with a big stone, big stone label, this you know, person I possess with it. I think in the 80s, you know, we had the rise of sort of investment banking. We had Wall Street mm -hmm. and, and the city and we had this massive leap in terms of money um, and it became very conspicuous wealth. Um, and, you know, powerful men like beautiful women. And that has been an age old combination. Um, and I think, you know, there's nothing wrong with being gifted something wonderful. But sometimes that comes with a price. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're young and beautiful, uh, it's fine. And then as you get older, you realize sometimes that, you know, what are you going to do now? So I think it's a dangerous path to tread unless you have a plan as the woman to do something, you know, when when somebody younger comes along. But in that heyday, in that moment of being gifted something wonderful, who's going to say no to that? I mean, it's, it's wonderful if that's if that's your life. But for most of us who aren't top models, most of us, you know, have to work. And actually, most of us earn our own money and, and buy our own things. Um, and I think the 70s were a real turning point because women, um, you know, it's the start of contraception and, mm -hmm. and women working, you know, and getting careers rather than just sort of, you know, paying the bills. And I think it was a really a massive turning point for jewellery. Jewellery became bigger and mm -hmm. more powerful because women were going into the office, meaning mm -hmm. business, and jewellery became a part of that uniform. Mm -hmm. That kind of, you know, and then you had, of course, you had the 80s and the power look and the shoulders and the massive jewellery. Um, you know, I quite, as you can see from my shoulder pads, quite like an 80s shoulder pad. And then you had the <laughs> dynasty in the Dallas. And, you know, I just, it's a really nice evolution, I think. You know, mm -hmm. we've come to a point where women are really in the boardroom, running countries. You know, those women um, still want to get a nice present, but they, they're also capable of buying whatever they like and mm -hmm. that's an important you know that that's important to have all your all your bases covered when it comes to jewelry i would say and women watching please comment be honest like how yeah. many of you in have that deeply ingrained message right some man is going to gift me some man is coming to take care of this because i think yeah. it's a it's a pretty deep sentiment that gets expressed when we look at the way that we choose jewelry or don't choose jewelry Right, that, that whole advertising campaign about the right hand ring, can you buy a diamond for yourself? Now, we're gonna come to it because you point out that um, in China, prior mm -hmm. to the Cultural Revolution, jewelry was equal to all other art forms. And what we're seeing right now is a lot of really cool female designers coming out of China and Taiwan. So mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit, this is Feng Jie again, who just hit that massive 26 million results mm -hmm. at auction. How do you see that connection from the cultural revolution mm -hmm. or pre-revolution rather, the exceptionally long history of appreciation of the arts and jewelry as an equal art to what mm -hmm. we're seeing now? I think China is a great example because you know, lots of people in the West have chased the Chinese money mm -hmm. in the last, say, 10 years mm -hmm. um, because it is a phenomenal scale of powerful, rich, wealthy collectors who are coming out of China. They're very sophisticated. They really know their stuff. They really like learning about the culture and history of jewellery, which is great. Um, and there's no point in sort of doing a dragon motif. They want the authentic experience. They want to go to Paris and buy something very, very French. Mm -hmm. So... Within that, because there's this reawakening of the Chinese um, sort of thirst for, for great jewellery, uh, it's inspired a completely new generation of designers, you know, going for it as a, as a career. And there's some very young designers. I mean, Feng Jie's in her early 30s. You know, she penetrated the Place Vendôme, which is very, very difficult to do for an outsider, especially a woman who's Chinese. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're really pioneering um, in terms of design and in terms of the market. And I think it's a brilliant thing to see. I'd love to see the same happen in other places. You know, I'd love to see some African, a wave of African female designers. And, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for other people to see what they've done and to sort of, and to go for it themselves. But it, it does okay. take a big home market to buy what you're doing, to mm -hmm. power forward. And that is the upside for China, at least, sure. in that they have the collectors at home to really buy things. 
you and I have talked about this, and I'm really interested mm -hmm. in the contrast between China and Japan at the height of the Japan bubble, because we did not see the same emergence. And I'm going to run through some of the designers that you highlighted. So again, this is mm -hmm. Feng Jay. We are, by the way, having a very lively back and forth in the chat. So <laughs> Emily Wheeler said it's also become a thing men want to put the biggest rock on their woman. It's a way of communicating yeah. that he's arrived to his wife yeah. in their social circle. Um, yeah. But it's also about expressing love. So can it just be nice? But if we go back to China mm -hmm. versus Japan, we have Feng Jie here. We've got Cindy Chow. Um, we have Michelle Ong, who I know you're going to talk more about. Again, we have Anna Hu. But when you see Japan at the height of the bubble with its great wealth and the absolute thirst for luxury, we mm. don't see this output of really, really, really high level jewelry design with women in particular mm. that we're seeing right now with China and Taiwan. Why mm. do you think that is? What do you think is different about now? I think it's a very different culture. And I mm. think the Japanese collector tends to go for very, very high quality, very small mm. uh, stones. Um, and, you know, the, Chine, the Chinese kind of aesthetic is much bolder. I think Japanese is much quieter in Japan. Um, and also, I, I, I opened the book with a Japanese designer. Um, you know, it's a very different... of. She's got great finds in this book. <laughs> you, I guarantee you will circle a few designers you've never heard of, no matter how much you love jewelry. And so I'd say, you know, Japanese jewelry tent began on the body, you know, they didn't, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, on, on sort of clothing and hair, you know, you put something on a kimono or in someone's hair, it wasn't necessarily on you. And so it's a very different culture. And I think it's, um, the, the Japanese collectors I talk to tend to collect very small sculptural pieces and a lot more sort of, well, I suppose more with more discretion in some ways, but obviously it's a much smaller place. Um, I think, you know, they're as different as saying, why, why is France and why is, you know, England so different? I mean, they're completely different cultures. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, I'd love to see more design coming out of Japan, contemporary mm -hmm. design. Um, it tends to just, you know, China and Chinese, I suppose, designers just are just having a moment. Sometimes you just have a culture which is just, you know, on fire and they just are. I would argue that the cultural revolution actually really helps with equality between the sexes. So women take on yeah. a very powerful role and a weird kind of focus on their individual empowerment. And as Richa just pointed out, you know, the role of women in Japan is very different. Um, yeah. For those of you who may not know, I was visiting faculty at the University of Tokyo. And one of the great privileges of my life was to learn about female power behind the scenes in Japan. Because Japan to me is the difference between, you know, what you see here and what's actually going on. And women control the money, they control mm -hmm. the children. They are incredibly powerful, but there is this outward expression of, you know, the giggling and all that that we associate with this mm -hmm. stereotype that doesn't actually pertain to where they derive power. But in contrast, after the Cultural Revolution, I think you do really see in China that men and women are on a very sort of overtly equalized playing field. And that may be some of it. I mean, just something to think about anyway. Mm. Um, I mm. also am very interested to talk about the fact that while we don't actually see many independent female designers of jewelry, almost mm. all the Maison have women mm -hmm. at their helm. And yeah. I'd love to kind of talk about, you know, how does having a female designer reflect in the designs? And for those of you listening, um, that would be uh, Claire Schwann in Boucheron, uh, Aneva Geoffroy for Graf, Victoire de Castellan for Dior. We have um, Francesca in Louis Vuitton. We have Caroline for Chopard, Laura Isabel Malerio for Malerio. Um, and here, of course, we have this really beautiful Boucheron example. So how do you think the female gaze in design affects it? And why do you think we see the women from inside, but not as much independently? I think independently, you know, as we've discussed, often investment is a barrier. Yeah. You know, it takes a lot of money to, to create a high jewelry collection, sometimes millions. Yeah. And like everything, it's hard, you know, 
equality, we haven't got equality yet in the workplace in terms of you know, financially. So it, it, you know, the average woman who comes out of uni or design school doesn't have a million dollars to play with to create a collection. And a lot of the female designers I talk to, the independents, one of their biggest problems is investment. Like just get, you know, you have to sell an entire collection to do another one. And it's, you know, it's tough. And I'm not saying men don't have it tough. Of course they do. But traditionally, you know, if you're a woman and you, you've got to look after some kids and you've, you've got a lot of other things, some aging parents, you've got to do all these other things, um, which then, you know, you find it harder to, to get your hands on that, that money at times. So I think that's a barrier. Um, I do want to add, by the way, yeah. that it's also uh, Maria Lalauni for Ilias Lalaones is a great okay. female designer at the helm, and they're with us on yeah. this uh, chat as well. Welcome. So what do you see in yeah. this design that reflects a female eye? Well, this is actually supposed to be fabric. Um, this is actually, you can't really see it well in this picture, but there are chains that hang yeah. down. And right. it moved. It's, it's a wonderful, it's almost like a garment, you know, it's a cape mm -hmm. of light. And I think, I think again, when you're wearing, when you're making something that you, you would wear, mm -hmm. it's slightly different. Mm -hmm. um, I think slightly, you know, Grayson Perry in the book at one point, when I interviewed him about a piece he'd made, you know, he said, um, women are the object and men basically admire that object in a way. Mm -hmm. And so when you're making to admire, it's slightly different than when you're making to wear, mm -hmm. to interact. So I've just noticed that some of the women making very big pieces do it in a way which is a very intimate experience because they're kind of doing it to wear rather than doing it to just look. Um, obviously, men are wearing massive, greatly fantastic jewellery at times, but it's still quite rare in the West. Whereas in the East, men wear much, much more adventurous jewellery. In India and China... I've, I've seen people wear phenomenal things that you would never get a man wearing in the West. So it's different way, wherever you go. Which I hope is changing. Thank you, Harry Styles. And I love to Thank you, Harry. Um, I, I also wanted to point out that it's a big difference with ready to wear clothing because there are not that many female designers for women's wear, but there actually mm -hmm. are almost all the designers for high jewelry are women inside the Grand Maison which is really interesting, I think. It's interesting. And I think it's quite a recent thing because a lot mm -hmm. of the women that you mentioned, I mean, you know, some people like Victoire has, you know, have been around for, for some time, but um, some of them are sort of like in their position for less than 10 years. So maybe it's just a recent phenomena. Maybe again, it's part of the evolution of female power that we're seeing women get to the top level in some very big houses, which mm -hmm. say 20, 30 years ago, we wouldn't have seen. So I think it's maybe part of the same phenomenon. That's a great point. So um, when you were talking about Alexandra Moore in the book, you yeah. make this point again that we've been talking about all the way through, big stones require big budgets and they're traditionally bought for investment. Do you see that changing now that we have more women on the inside, on the design side, as well as more women buying for themselves? And I'm gonna give the full view of this ring while you're talking. Yeah, I mean, I want it to change. I want it to move away from, you know, the big mm -hmm. rock. The, the interesting thing about this ring, and I'm gonna look at say what it's made. I think it's a, that's an Andean blue opal. Mm -hmm. um, is that the actual stones we're talking about are changing. And the, 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 the stones that are available in high jewellery are, are much more diverse than they used to be. You know, before you, you'd have a, an opal or a pearl or a, a ruby or a, an emerald. Now you're having enormous opals, you're having tanzanite, you're having things that would never be put into high jewellery previously. And I think that democracy of, of choice is, is great. Mm -hmm. So you can have a big look, but sometimes it isn't quite as expensive. Mm -hmm. And I think it means different things. The role of the stone is changing. It's not all about wealth now. Sometimes it's about style and showing your taste mm -hmm. more than showing your budget, which is nice. Um, and I should say you have female bench jewelers who are watching our chats. So you have Lynette Lewis and Latoya Boyd. So they both represent this new wave of sculptural art and jewelry that we're hoping to see more of. Mm. Um, 
that brings me actually to the technical with women. So mm -hmm. this is Nadia Morgenthaler, who's a nice example of highly technical and also lots of stones. So mm -hmm. to me, if we're trying to bridge kind of how do we make sure you call it art first, but it's also going to be that investment piece, that man showing off, that woman showing mm -hmm. off, right? How do you balance it? Can you talk a little bit about her work, please? Yeah, I really like Nadia because Nadia's a dark horse. Mm -hmm. You know, Nadia came from the back benches and I'm seeing that more and more. Um, people coming out of the shadows and actually making for themselves. You know, Nadia for many years made for lots of the big houses from, from very famous designers. Um, and she now is a, a very um, sought after designer in her own right. She mm -hmm. tends to use wonderful, I mean, this is a combination of culture pearls, natural pearls, and I think diamonds. She tends mm -hmm. to sort of go, she creates pieces of the Art Nouveau, Nouveau and kind of Belle Epoque kind of style. Mm -hmm. It's quite romantic. And again, my, my taste is, as you can see from my enormous ring I'm wearing mm -hmm. here, my, <laughs> my taste like? is quite modernist and quite sort of gothic in a way. But mm -hmm. there's something about her work which I just think is wonderful. And it's big. And I've borrowed pieces to wear before. And... Um, she just has this palette, which is quite sort of really beautifully done, quite pastel colored stones and sort of these tiny little natural pearls. Mm -hmm. And it, it's intricate, but it feels romantic, but fairly strong. And I think that's a hard balance. But well, I think because she's so technically competent, she can take more risks in a way because she does it herself and she knows exactly what, how it works. But yeah. she started off with silver. She started off with much plainer pieces and she worked her way up over many years. And I think it's a fallacy to think that you just start here. You don't just start here unless you're very, very gifted. Right. Right. Know, it's rare. Most people start with something much smaller and less complex. And mm -hmm. over 20 years, they become this. Mm -hmm. And so people often say to me, you know, I wish I had created this 10 years ago, but you can't. It's a journey. It's supposed right. to take this long. Right. And I want to just exit out of that for a minute. So Richa made the comment, and it's going back and forth, that it doesn't have to be the big stone because you're showing off. What if you actually just love the gemstone? So I think we right. also face this kind of weird duality where you want to right. show your power. But what if you actually just love it? Right. What if you see this magnificent, cool, big gem and you're not flexing as much as you are just bringing yourself joy? Because, I mean, mm. uh, you know, something that's made it for 3.5 billion years is a miracle of nature. What if you yeah. just love it, right? And, you know, I think it's also a little frustrating when we hear a story like, you know, the one we just talked about with Nadia, where, you know, mm. she has been behind the scenes for so long, yeah. right? How many of the, you know, wonderful people who are even on this chat right now work behind the scenes and someone else's name is on the door, yeah. right? It's the training you need, but their style, their contribution, I think we're not necessarily seeing it. And I, I'm gonna, you can smack me on this one because I didn't warn you in advance, but I'm wondering, you know, in, the, in one of your last chats, um, yeah. you made the comment that an artist has a distinctive style. But when I think about a Paul Flato, for example, who employed multiple designers who each had very distinctive styles, the name Paul Flato goes on the door. But when you compare those two pieces side by side, as I've discussed um, with Christopher Walling, you know it was a different person, right? The yeah. name, though, is Paul Flato. So when we look at the work now that Nadia is doing, you know, part mm -hmm. of me screams, oh, I want to see all the pieces that had some other house's name on it, yeah. but they were actually you. And I want to see your evolution. And so mm -hmm. I think we, we see that now, you know, we do have women at the helm. And as you said, that's pretty recent, but there were a lot of women in the back, right? So we yeah. do see actually female bench jewelers that, you know, worked with Verdura, for example, for mm -hmm. years. Um, for David Webb for years, but we don't know their names necessarily. So yeah. I think it is going to be really interesting to see, you know, can we give a shout out? Uh, Katrina is saying in the 70s, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so can we give a shout out and recognize what, you know, these female designers are accomplishing, even if it is a big stone, can we classify yeah. it as art? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think big stuff, yeah, the materials are immaterial for me mm -hmm. when it comes to art. Mm -hmm. We're still caught up in, if it's a diamond, it's this. 
if it's a ruby it's that it doesn't matter we know it's art when we see it because it moves us and it changes everything you know mm -hmm. i didn't go to cartier in the Place Vendôme and think it's cartier it's really you know expensive i was moved by the art i was moved by what it meant mm -hmm. i was moved by the history and that that connection changed my life and i think we're talking about pieces which change your life there are pieces that i saw 20 years ago i still can't forget that i still think about you know i think the point is it as an entity jewelry is a magical thing mm -hmm. and gems and gemstones are part of that magic but without the actual design it doesn't mean anything mm -hmm. you know otherwise we'd have just gems Right. So it has to go into a vessel of meaning, which is the actual design. <laughs> so I've put up the the Toi Moi Belle Peron ring. Um, I mean, this is one of my favorites of all time. Uh, same. Fabulous. And Richard just pointed out, even Fabergé had female designers back then. And mm -hmm. uh, Ilias Laounis Museum just said, great topic for an exhibition, female jewelry behind the scenes. Wouldn't that be oh, awesome? That good. I'm writing that down. <laughs> Write that down. That's awesome. So you heard it here first. It's going to be curated. It's going to happen. And wouldn't it be nice if we had more serious exhibitions? I'm personally crushed yeah. that I can't see the Van Cleef and Arpels exhibition mm. right now. Hopefully, we'll get through COVID. It will be in time, and we'll all be able to visit and enjoy. Um, I do want to kind of circle back to our original start, which is, you know, when you talked about um, why we don't see, and I'll, I'll go for the big gun first. When you talked about why we don't see jewelry as art very often, you know, it is, you point out that it is because in part it's wearable currency, that it's not perceived as art because it was made to be sold as opposed to a pure expression of thought and art collectors need meaning. So when we think about how to communicate that meaning, you know, if you are an artist like the ones on this call, Right? How are you communicating your meaning? What forum do you have? Because in contemporary art, we have Art Basel, we have Freeze, we have yeah. all these ways to interact. And this, of course, is Jar, um, who does get you know, the big gun call out. So yeah. how do you think it can be communicated more effectively in the absence of more exhibitions, in the absence of the obvious art fairs? Well, we do need museums. Museums are key mm -hmm. because museums mm -hmm. are cultural um, showcases for mm -hmm. what is within history the most important moments you know of our mm -hmm. lifetime so I love the fact that museums you know and you know this is a jar ram brooch I love the fact that you know the Met gave him a, an exhibition of scale you know mm -hmm. that's important that was not just important for him it was important for all of jewelry and the history mm -hmm. of jewelry to be recognized on that platform as something mm -hmm. which is that important so we need more museums we need exhibitions in galleries, in art spaces. We need people to exhibit in, in, you know, in places that share a platform with fine art as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is a Wallace Chan piece, again, a fantastic piece of sculpture. Um, from, and Wallace has made a porcelain five times stronger than steel, and he makes his own materials. You know, it's also important to have people make part of the jewel mm -hmm. themselves if they can. Not everyone mm -hmm. can, but, you know, that's something you know, that we can include. But essentially, we need to talk about the art and not about the materials mm -hmm. as much. So mm -hmm. I'm less interested in us talking about a 20 karat diamond and what that is, rather than the actual meaning of the piece as a whole. And mm -hmm. this is a great piece by Nicholas Varney. Um, and this is a great case in point. It's a lovely, huge agate bangle. Yeah. There are stones, there are, there are diamonds, but again, they're just, they, they happen to the piece in a very quiet way. It's not about the stone. The whole piece is a stone. Mm -hmm. It's about the design. So we need to talk about what the design means more than how big the stones are, where they came from. You know, fine artists don't talk about the easel and the paint. They talk about the meaning of the piece. We, we need to do that a bit more if we can. I 
I agree. And, and Nick made that funny comment in a chat with you earlier this week that, you know, it's a, it's a cheap trick to pave your way out of it. You can't hide exactly. anything with this piece. This was brutal to make. And if you make a mistake, you've got to scrap it and start over. So in its simplicity, it actually is displaying the skill of the craftsman, right? It's a yeah, really it, elegant, lovely work. This is an important piece because all, all designers who reach a, a high level, they all often do it with a very complex combination of stones and design. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as I said to Nicholas, when he made this piece, the fact is you need a quiet version of yourself as well as a loud version. Mm -hmm. You need the contrast. You need, you know, the Fabergé egg versus the stone potato that he also made out of egg ape. You know, Nicholas is going down a road which great designers go down where they show different sides of themselves. And you can't be scared to do that. It's part of greatness. So mm -hmm. yes, I definitely love and want this bangle as much as I love the other things he does. And there's, there's, there's room for both. Totally agree. And you got this really nice comment from Ophora. Instead of the price of stone, let's focus on the meaning of the stone. Right, let's yeah. focus on what these art pieces are giving us, whether they be big stone or a lot of impressive, complex pave work, which can obviously be art as well. Yes. Um, we're in our last four minutes, so I want to just have you please tell people, if you don't already have Coveted, you have to go out and get it. It is so interesting. You are going to find new designers that you don't know. Where can people buy the book other than Amazon? So Fiden.com. Um, go there, go to Amazon. I mean, it's kind of, it's, I Googled it shamelessly the other day and there's lots and lots of places in your country, wherever you're from, which uh, lots of bookshops sell it. So basically just have a Google. Um, and I'm hoping at some point next year to do some kind of book tour so I can sign people's books. Awesome. So if anything, you know, I should be putting things on Instagram if I ever get to leave my flat, which would be nice. <laughs> well, we are at our limit. You are the greatest. For everyone watching, thank you for joining us and for having such a smart, fun conversation with the great Melanie Grant. Um, she is also in charge of one epic Instagram. So if you're not already following her, you should because she's funny as hell. So thank you, everybody. Wishing you all a wonderful holiday season. Melanie, I love the book. I love hanging out with you. You are the coolest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. It's been wonderful. And it's gone so quickly. I, I like, know. I told you. Well, you guys should know on the side, we could talk for hours and hours and we hours. do. So yeah. we figured if none of you showed up, we would just blab together. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you, everyone. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye, everyone. Ciao. Thank you.